begin our, our time together, I want to show you a, a brief video clip. But before I do that, I want to give you some context so you understand what's going on in this video clip. Uh, th this clip is, it was shot April 5th, 1988 by a guy named Ivan Lester McGuire. Uh, Ivan Lester McGuire was a, an, is an experienced skydiver. He had done over 800 jumps. Um, I have not once jumped out of a perfectly good airplane, but he, for some reason, said, you know what, that sounds like a good thing to do 800 times. Um, I, I'm sort of torn. How many, have anybody in here been skydiving? Anybody? Hey. There you go. I, I'm sort of torn at this point in my life. Like, the idea of it sounds fun. And then I, I look at, like, my wife and my kids, and I'm like, you know what? It doesn't sound that fun. Not to mention, I don't know if I die skydiving. I don't know if my life insurance is going to pay out on that one. You know what I'm saying? So... I don't, part of me thinks it sounds fun, part of me is like, no. But Ivan Lester McGuire, he thought it sounded great. 800 jumps. So he was a, a skydiver, also a videographer. So the plan for the day, uh, the video that I'm going to show you, was he was he's going to jump out of the plane, and then a, an instructor and a student were going to skydive behind him, going tandem, and he was going to videotape them. Does that make sense? So, so you'll see in the video, he sort of climbs out of the plane. Uh, the, the instructor and the student come out, and then they jump, and there's no audio, um, so don't freak out, be like, where's the audio? It's not there, but I'll commentate. It'll be fun. Y'all ready? Check out this video. So right here, you'll notice uh, the instructor and the student are getting ready to jump out of the plane. Ivan jumps first, followed by the, the student and the instructor, and you'll notice about right there, um, they'll pull the chute, they go up. You will now notice Ivan freak out. Because it's about this point where he realizes he did not have a parachute. 800 jumps, and that one jump, he wasn't prepared. One prepared for. He, he wasn't written in the, the Orlando Sentinel, April 5th, 1988. It said this it said, Ivan Lester McGuire, 35, of Durham, died in a bizarre accident Saturday. McGuire was filming a jump by other parachutists. Footage recorded by a voice-activated camera attached to his helmet led investigators to believe McGuire did not realize he was without a parachute. It kind of appears he reached for his parachute and didn't have one, Captain Ralph Brown said after reviewing the tape. Brown said he was 99% sure McGuire never was wearing a parachute. We are all preoccupied with doing our own job, said Paul Fayard, owner of the Franklin County Sport Parachute Center. I think in the excitement over taping the show, I think he just forgot his parachute. So why am I telling you this? Because if we fail to be prepared, the consequences can be deadly. Ivan would agree. If we fail to be prepared, and so why do I say this? Because in this series, we're, um, it's called Lent, preparing our hearts for Easter. And so we're going to spend the next six weeks getting our hearts prepared to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And, and so that's what this series is going to be about, is uh, preparing our hearts. And some of you may be sitting there saying, okay, well, what in the world is Lent? And in a lot of Baptist churches, you don't hear the word Lent, but I'll tell you what it is. That way we can understand. Lent is a season of preparation and repentance during which we anticipate the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is a journey to the cross, meditating on our sin and weakness, looking to Jesus as our perfect example and substitute, and being heightened in our worship as his victory over Satan, sin, and death. And, and the purpose of Lent is to pre prepare our hearts for Easter that we may mourn the darkness in our hearts and rejoice in the light of God who came into the world to save us. You see, if we don't understand the depravity, the sinfulness of our own hearts, if we don't fully understand that, then we will never fully understand the beauty of the gospel. And so that's why we, we take this time in this season of Lent to prepare our hearts for Easter. Now, I want each, of, each and every one of you in here, if you have a cell phone, I want you to take it, hold it up in the air. There you go. It's okay, you can use the cell phone in church. I did this last week, but if you didn't do this last week, I want you to open a text message uh, right now. Yes, text in church, it's good. Open a text message and type it out to 81010. And then in the text message, put the at sign LBC Devo, 
at LBC Devo. What this is, is tomorrow, if, if you do this, you're going to receive uh, a text message tomorrow morning with a devotional um, that has been put together to go with this series. We, we didn't put it together. There's a, a church in Austin, a Providence Church. They're the ones who put it together. But um, having done this uh, since this past Wednesday, it is a great resource as we seek to prepare our hearts for Easter. And we seek to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. So I highly recommend, it, it'll take you maybe 10 or 15 minutes each day. Uh, but this, this series is going to coincide with this devotional. So I highly encourage you to text that and get that devotional. Text 81010 and text at LBC Devo. You see, this series, we're going to talk about rep- repentance this week. Next week, we're going to talk about humility and then suffering, lament, sacrifice, and death. And it's going to culminate on on Easter Sunday where we're going to do a sermon and we're going to ask, who is Jesus? Because if you think about it, if Jesus really did rise from the dead... That, that's it. Like, no, I know um, so, some of my friends who, who aren't believers, you know, will have arguments, uh, or not arguments, talks, uh, about Christianity. And one of the things I've said is, I said, listen, if, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, can we at least agree that all the, the reservations you have, none of them matter anymore? If Jesus really did rise from the dead. So, so Easter Sunday, we're going to look at that. Who is Jesus? Did he actually rise from the dead? But today we're going to start and we're going to talk about repentance. And what is repentance? But before we do that, the passage that John read earlier, I want to give you some background on what that passage was. Because if you don't know the background to that passage, it might be hard to understand. What that passage was is how many of you know who King David is? That passage was King David repenting of sin in his life. Now let me tell you what had gone on with King David. King David, um, in 2 Samuel 11, here's sort of the breakdown of of what happens. David stayed home from war. Typically, the king would go to war with his army. David had stayed home. We don't know why, but he already wasn't where he should be. And what happens? David sees a, a, a girl named Bathsheba bathing on the roof of her house. And now before you're like, well, why was she bathing on the roof of her house? That In that time, that was not abnormal. But David sees her, and she's bathing on the roof, and rather than being like, oh, hello, uh, no, David does a, hello. Now, Bathsheba is a married woman, okay? But what does David do? Rather than averting his eyes and saying, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to lust. I'm, I'm going to focus my attention elsewhere. He says, hey, I want to get to know Bathsheba. King's officials, you should go get her, and so we can talk and fellowship together. And so David and Bathsheba, Bathsheba comes and they, they fellowship. Or if we want to use a 17th century word, they uh, fadoodle. Uh, there you go, if you want to go look that one up. But what happens is they, David and Bathsheba, David commits adultery with Bathsheba. And it doesn't stop there. Come to find out, Bathsheba gets pregnant. Well, she's a married woman. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, is actually one of David's mighty men, if you read scripture. So he's off at battle. And David's fadoodling with his wife. So Uriah, or David says, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to cover this up. So now I'm going to deceive and lie to cover up my sin. How does that work typically? You sin and I'm just going to deceive and lie about it. That'll make it better. Does that ever make it better? No, but David thinks it will. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have Uriah come and, and spend some time with his wife. You know, he, he's off at war. I'm going to call him back and they can spend some time together. What happens Uriah comes back and says, hey, I I can't go spend time with my wife while while my brothers are off at war. That's not fair. I can't do that. And so David's plan is thwarted. And he says, okay, fine. Go go back uh, to battle Uriah. And what does he tell the army to do? He says, go into battle. And at a given point, you're to fall back, leaving Uriah helpless. So David essentially murders Uriah to cover up his own sin. And I want to take a side note, because this is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. If we look at Acts 13, I want to read what God's word says about David. Acts 13 verse 21 says this, it says, then they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king and testified about him 
I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart, who will carry out all my will. Now, based on what I've just talked through, is David necessarily one that you would say, yes, that's a man after God's own heart? No. We read that, those passages in 2 Samuel, it's like, well, what is going on? You know, the New Testament calls this a man after God's own heart, yet um, he's lusted, he's committed adultery, he's deceived, he's lied, he's murdered. I think there's something we need to understand here. Yes, David did all those things, but as we see in Psalm 51, David was repentant of his sin. Yes, did David sin big? Did he mess up huge? He did. But as we see, it broke his heart. And I think for us as believers, we need to apply this to our lives and understand there's no sin that's too outrageous for us to commit. There is no sin that is too outrageous for any of us in this room to commit, but also there is also no sin that is too big for God to forgive. And we need to remember that, and we see that clearly laid out in the life of David. A a man who messed up big, yet the New Testament calls him a man after God's own heart. And I'm convinced that that's because we read Psalm 51 and we see that David's sin broke his heart. So what is repentance? I think there's a few things that we see in Psalm chapter 51. The first we see is that repentance is a response to God's grace. Repentance is a response to God's grace. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you uh, to write these things down. But repentance is a response to God's grace. In verse or Psalm 51, verse 1, it says this. It says, be gracious to me, God. According to what? According to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. You see, God's love and compassion is what drives David to repentance. Because true repentance is about God. It's not about us. And oftentimes we, we try to make it about us. But true repentance is focused on God and is a response to his grace. But I'm afraid that that oftentimes we make it about us. You see, this picture, you you see a train track. And at the center, if you follow the train track, is what? God. But notice on the left and right, there's two ditches. And a lot of times, I'm afraid that we fall into one of those ditches. When it, when it comes to repentance, we fall in one of these, it's either self-beating, we, we, we say things like, I'll never do that again, and we just beat ourselves up, and beat ourselves up, and, beat ourselves, and I'll never do that, and, and, and I can fix this. And that's what our repentance looks like. Or, on the other side, it's self-loathing. And we say, I can't believe I did that, and we just beat ourselves up, and beat ourselves up, and beat ourselves up. And so on one hand, we beat ourselves up, on the other hand, We say, well, I can fix it. I can do better. But notice, who is the the core person doing the action there? It's us. We say, I can do better, or or, I can't believe I did that. And so it's a self-centered version of repentance. Neither of those is centered on Christ, where it should be. But what happens when when we make repentance about Christ and not about us? So when, when, we, when we look at God and we make repentance about him, rather than falling into either of these two traps, we are led into deeper communion with him. As a result, we realize we've sinned, we're separated from you, but our repentance is what leads us to communion with him. Romans 2, 4, it says this, it says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. The first thing we see about repentance is that it is, is, is a response to God's grace. The second thing that we see is repentance is addressed to God. Verses 2 through 4 say this, Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Repentance is addressed to God. And why is repentance addressed to God or centered on God? Because who's the one that we've sinned against? God, and we see David clearly sees this. He says, against you, you alone I have sinned. 
To give you an illustration of this, um, those of you in here that, that are parents, I'm, I'm sure you've had an experience like this, um, but, but sometimes my children, they have uh, sibling squabbles. H- is it, have any parents in here? With, with more, I, I feel like parents with only one child, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about because you haven't had the, he touched me, she touched me, he touched me, she touched me. But with two kids, you get that and you have squabbles sometimes and it's fun. But oftentimes these squabbles will happen, um, whether it's, you know, she took this, he took this, he pushed me, whatever. Um, and what we do with our kids, it, it, a lot of times what they'll try to do is they'll come to me or they'll come to Melody and they'll say, Mommy, my is so sorry. And they have the tears and oh, it, it's like, oh, it touches your heart. But what's the problem? They're not apologizing to the right person. And, and so what we have to do is we have to get down with our kids and hold their cute little hands and say, listen, I'm glad that you're sorry. But you need to go tell your brother. You need to go tell your sister because they're the one that you've sinned against. And it's the same with our walk with God. He's the one we've sinned against. So that's why our repentance, it needs to be addressed to him. The third thing we see is that repentance is taking responsibility. In verses five through nine, it says this. It says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. What do we see here? We see David, is, he's admitting his sin without any if, ands, or buts. What we don't see here is David saying, yeah, God, so uh, forgive me for that, but, um, I mean, she was, like, on the roof, just, like, completely open. I mean, we don't see David rationalizing his sin. We see David saying, no, I'm taking responsibility. It was my sin. It concerns me a lot of times. uh, We, as Christians, we try to pass off our sin on somebody else well, I wouldn't have dot, dot, dot if so-and-so hadn't dot, dot, dot. We need to take responsibility for our actions. We don't have control over what anybody else does, but we do have control of the reaction and response that we have. And we need to realize that. Because honestly, Scripture tells us that in those moments of, of stress and frustration, what comes out is what's in here. And so in those moments, we need to look at our heart and say, okay, is that what's in my heart? And if so, we take responsibility. We repent. But it, it, as we, we read this passage, how do we know what we need to repent of? You know, it, we can't take responsibility if we don't know. Hebrews 4, it says this. It says, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit joints and marrow, It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So if we want to know what we need to repent of, where do we go? We go to God's word. Because this passage says, it says the word of God is living, it's effective, sharper than any double-edged sword. If we want to know, God, God, what do I need to repent of? We go to his word and we hold it up and we look and say, that's my sin. That's what I need to repent of. I want to give you uh, sort of an illustration uh, of this, of what it looks like for us to come face to face with the word of God and say, okay, as a response, I need to repent. Uh, My family, we we vacation a lot in Pigeon Forge, uh, Tennessee. It's really pretty. Uh, It's fun. This is uh, the view from the, the condo you know, that that we're at. And so we like to go and hang out and we like to sip tea or coffee or whatever and just sit on the balcony and just relax, maybe read a book. And and our our kids have started doing that as well. This is Dawson and Sayla with their bubble wands. Um, I'm sure that the people like two and three stories below were wondering why are their bubbles just cascading uh, off the side of the building? It would be my children, they're the ones, but they like to come out on the balcony, hang out with us, play with their bubble wands, Um, And this is them playing with the the sliding glass door because why not see if you can cover the sliding glass door with bubbles? Because mommy and daddy love cleaning that. That, That's fun, right? But I want to tell you a story real quick. Uh, We're going to step back. This is before Dawson and Selah enjoyed playing with the sliding door, okay? 
uh, we, we went, we had gone uh, to Pigeon Forge, sort of got settled in, and Melody and I were out on the balcony, um, just sort of drinking tea, drinking coffee, and Dawson and Sailor were with some family playing uh, sort of in the, the condo area. And so Melody and I are sitting there talking, just looking at the view, and um, all we hear is, I'm like, what in the world? So I turn around, and there's Dawson lying on the floor, and he has this like look on his face, like, what just happened? I don't know. What had happened was he wanted to come see mommy and daddy. He did not, this is the first time he had encountered a sliding glass door. So Dawson, in his enthusiasm to come see mommy and daddy, ran smack into the thing. Like just as hard as he could, just plaw. But you got to understand, in his little, probably at the time he was probably two, in his two-year-old mind, he did not comprehend what just took place. Like to him, he, he doesn't know the glass door is there. So in his mind, he is laying on the ground thinking, did the air just like stop me? Like what happened? And so you can see, like I look at him, and as a parent, you, you like want to commiserate, but it was really funny. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm not the dad that was like, oh buddy, come here. I was like, <laughs> oh, come here, come here. Um, so I, I'm laughing, but it's because Dawson, like he just has this complete look of utter betrayal. Like, I don't know what just, I don't know what, what, it, what hit me. I don't know. Because he doesn't know that there's a glass, a glass door there. He has no idea. Why do I tell you this illustration? Because when it comes to repentance, God's word is like that glass door. And that it, it confronts us with the reality of something that we would not have seen otherwise. Dawson didn't see that door, but it surely confronted him very quickly. Very quickly, he realized that door is there. I need to not run into it anymore. That's what God's word does to us when it comes to repentance. It shows us, it reveals, here's sin, you need to deal with this. We need to take responsibility for it. In order to take responsibility for our sin, we must go to God's word and, and say, okay, God, what do I need to repent of? And, and, and we have to understand, why, why is it so important? When we're talking about repentance, taking responsibility for our sin, it's important because without first understanding the dark, depraved ugliness of our sin, we can never fully understand the beauty of the gospel. And so it's like John was saying, we're, we're not, we, we don't come, hey, we want everybody to feel guilty. No, we, we, we want to understand that we are completely depraved, we're sinful, we're separated from Christ, because if we don't understand that, we don't understand the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. It's like when I, um, when I went to buy uh, Melody's engagement ring, um, this is not her engagement diamond, just so I don't want anybody to be confused. Uh, this is not it. But when I went to go get uh, her engagement ring, the, the jeweler kept, you know, they had a black cloth that they would put the ring on and let me look at it. And I was like, why in the world are you putting on, on, on a black cloth? Like, you can just hand it to me and look at it. And they said, well, when you look at the diamond it, with the backdrop of the bl black cloth, the blackness of the cloth is what helps you understand the brilliance of the diamond. The same way with our sin. If we understand the darkness of our own heart, then we can fully understand the brilliance of the gospel. So the fourth thing we see is that repentance is turning to God. Repentance is turning to God. In verse 10, it says this, it says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. What's going on here? David asked God to sanctify him and renew his spirit. You see, repentance is turning away from sin and to who? God, you see, we're turning away from our sin, but we're turning to focus on God. And it's interesting, we, we ask ourselves the question, you know, who gives us the strength to do this? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it or stand up under it. You see, the one who gives us the strength to, to make that turn away from our sin and to God is God himself. We don't even have the strength to turn from our sin aside from him. And if we don't fully understand this, we don't fully understand the gospel. The final thing we see is that repentance is ongoing. Verses 11 and 12 say this, Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. 
Well, what, what, is, what does it mean, sustain me, by giving me a willing spirit, a willing spirit to pursue God fervently? And, and I want you to understand that, that saying that repentance is ongoing, uh, some people may hear this and they'll say, oh, does that mean we can lose our salvation? No, that's not what that means. What that means is that we, as believers, the side of heaven, we still continue to sin. We, we have not reached perfection. We, we, we understand the gospel and we realize because of our sin, we need Christ. But it's not like we accept him and sin just ceases. We're, we're done. We don't do that anymore. That would be nice. How many of you wish that were the case? Like, that would just be so nice. But it's not. And so we continue to sin, which is why we repent. And I want to make a side note real quick and, and sort of pose the question of where's the best place wrestle with repentance. It's in community. We, we need brothers and sisters in Christ who can encourage us and say, hey, I, I love you, but I see this going on and I don't think that's honoring to God. I, I have some, some brothers in my life who have done that to me. I, I will admit it's not the funnest thing. You're not like, hey, thanks for that. I appreciate that. But we need it if we truly want to reflect Christ well. We need brothers and sisters who are willing to ask us the hard questions and say the tough things. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says it this way. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So what is Repentance. Repentance is a response to God's grace. It's addressed to God because he's the one that we've sinned against. And it's us taking responsibility for our actions and turning to God. But also it's, it, it's an ongoing thing because this side of heaven, we continue to sin. There's a preacher by the name of, of Charles Spurgeon uh, he said it this way. He said, repentance is a change of mind with regard to sin, with regard to everything indeed, and it is a consciousness that sin is sin, that you have committed it. It is a sorrow to you that you have committed it, and a resolve in God's strength that you will escape from it, a holy desire and longing to be rid of sin which has done you so much mischief or so much harm. Or there, there's a, a children's poem that says it this way. It is not enough to say we're sorry and repent, yet still go on from day to day just as we always went. Repentance is to leave the sins we loved before and show that we in earnest grieve by doing so no more. I'm going to invite the, the band to, to come up here and we're going to have a time where we respond in song. Um, but I want to challenge you, each and every one of you that, that are here today, as we've walked through this, is there a sin that God has shown you as we've walked through? This is what repentance is. Is there a sin in your life that you say, I need to repent of that? And, and you know, as, we, as we've looked at God's word, I've seen that there are some areas in my life I need to repent of. If that's the case, this altar is open. You don't need to come to me. You don't need to come to, to John or any of the pastors. Come up here and do business with God.